Oh, yeah. I kicked it. I didn't realize it was not capped. OK. Um, so I'm going to talk today about a, just one project, one of uh, several projects that's, uh, that are going on in the lab. Um, this is a project that started out as a simple question and has sort of grown into something more. Um, I'll start with a, a film. In fact, I'm going to show you three films. Um, and this film shows a hawk moth. So this is a hawk moth that we study. It's called Daphnis neri. Uh, it flaps its wings at about 30 times a second. It's filmed in regular speed, 25 frames a second. And what you see it doing is uh, feeding from these lantana flowers. They're, these are tiny flowers. And this animal operates in, in fairly low light conditions. So hawk moths typically are crepuscular. This one is actually operating at night. We are filming it in infrared. And it has just a little bit of light. Um, and what you saw it doing uh, was being very precise about where, where it hovered and inserting its proboscis. Let me go over it again. Um, inserting its proboscis accurately in, 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 the, uh, in the flower center and being able to uh, feed from it. Now what happens if you make this flower move? Now this is Manduka. It's very similar to Daphnis. But this time it's feeding on an artificial flower. And the flower is moving at, at various frequencies. Again, this is all happening in dark. And as you can see, the animal is able to keep track of the flower while it's moving. This is obviously something that the animal has to deal with in nature because the flower um, uh, sways with air, breeze, and so on. Again, this is filmed at regular speed. But let's just look at what, uh, what it would look like uh, if you were to um, film it with high speed cameras. This is, again, the same experiment. But this time, the flower is moving back and forth. And I want you to notice how uh, nicely the moth is able to track this uh, with, with very little uh, latencies. This is, again, Manduka Sexta. This was a film uh, taken by Michael Tu uh, in a lab that I used to work in. The other thing I want you to notice is that while it is doing this, its antennae are very nicely positioned. They are also oscillating, but you can't see that because this is high speed. Um, but they're positioned at a very constant angle. And that's actually the question that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, the, the broad questions that my lab is interested in have sort of focused on, on these two things. One is that flight control related behaviors need to be fast because insects typically flap at tens to hundreds of hertz. Uh, but also that they have to be precise because any small errors can, can very quickly um, uh, spiral out of control. So how are they able to achieve both speed and precision? And we are uh, addressing this question in two animals. I'm going to just talk about one of them today. Uh, this is the Daphnis neri, the one that you saw in the very first film, uh, moth in fatigues, as we call it. And the second one is this humble little creature called soldier fly. It looks like a wasp. It's a wasp mimic, actually. Uh, but, but it is actually a fly. And one of the nice things about it is, is that it has uh, white hot ears. Hot ears are these hand wings uh, that have been reduced. And this fly, they're used as gyroscopes. And so they're involved in flight control, which is why we are uh, interested in it. Now, some years ago, we. Uh, observed that uh, antennal mechanosensors, especially in the case of uh, moths that have four wings, uh, of insects that have two pairs of wings, um, are involved in flight control. That if you knock off these uh, inputs, then the animal is unable to control its trajectory in space. But if you restore these inputs, then the animal can, uh, can fly um, all right. And then you can record from these neurons and you know, the, the, uh, the tuning properties, uh, as well as the forces on the antennae, all suggested that these were being used as uh, sort of like gyroscopes uh, in, in flies, which is why we got interested in looking at antennae in the first place. But one of the first things that a moth does, and you'll see this in a little bit, 
is that it positions its antennae, which is why we are interested in looking at uh, what's happening at the base of the antennae. So before I go into that, let me just quickly introduce you to the brain of the moth. This is the head of the moth. The front part of it is cut out. That's the antenna. The antenna in all flying insects uh, is made up of three segments. Uh, the basal segment is called the scape. The next one is called the pedicel. And all of this is one uh, long segment. A segment is defined as something that has its own set of muscles. So this is uh, actually not even a true segment. It's, it's uh, called a flagellum. Uh, it's multi-annular. So there are a set of muscles that moves the scape relative to the, uh, to the head capsule. Then there is a set of muscles right there, which moves the pedicel relative uh, to, the, to the scape. And then you have the flagellum, which vibrates passively. It doesn't have its own set of muscles. And these vibrations are tracked by a set of mechanosensors called Johnston's organs. So you can see the single little units here through projections at the base of the flagellum right there. And they surround the antenna. So they are all around this. And these are the mechanosensors that are involved in flight control. The other set of mechanosensors, this is the scanning electron micrograph of a, of a, a Daphnis antenna. The other set of mechanosensors are these bristle-shaped structures. Uh, they're called Bohm's bristles, after, the, after Bohm, who in, uh, first observed them. And this is the rough arrangement uh, of these uh, relative to the muscles and the forked nerve that goes into the antenna and so on. Now, one of the reasons why this is such an interesting system is that all of the information that the antenna receives, so the mechanosensory information here, the olfactory information all along the flagellum, and some of the other information like hygrosensory or uh, thermosensory, all of this goes through this one nerve into the brain. Okay? And the motor information going out to the muscles also goes through that. So it is possible to access that information right there, which allows us to do intracellular recordings and many other things that, that make, makes this just a handy system to work with. OK, so I mentioned that the, the antenna uh, is positioned in a very specific way. So normally, if you look at a moth, its antennae are tucked uh, under its wings. But when you startle it, as we are doing here, the antenna are the first things to come forward. And they actually stay in the same place uh, while the animal is flying at any given speed. And that shows just how constant that uh, antennal angle is as the animal is flying. So one of the first things we need to do is to bring this assay into the lab. So what we do is we tether the moth. Um, we have uh, the antenna attached to the, um, uh, we have uh, some iron filings attached to the end of the antenna. And we have an electromagnet, uh, which uh, we can periodically switch on and off. And every time this light turns off, the magnet is on. So let me just play this. So now we're pulling it. Let me switch it off. We'll go back. So what we are trying to do here is see how the antenna repositions when you, um, when you perturb it from its uh, actual position. Notice the vibrations of the antenna. OK, so now you can quantify this information. This is the electromagnetic field turning on and off. And here's the antenna. This is the angle at which it started. And every time we pull and then let it go, it comes right back to the original angle. And if you overlay these returns uh, one on top of each other, you can see that they are fairly uh, stereotypic uh, in their response. So the question we asked ourselves is, how does the moth know where its antenna is? Uh, wh what are the sensory organs that, uh, that tell the moth where its antennae are. And our suspect candidates for this 
for the sensory organs were these Bohm's bristles um, because they, they sit right at the lip, uh, or at the interface of the two segments. So anytime there's a gross movement of the antenna, these bristles can go in and out of this and that we thought would constitute a sensory signal. Um, and if the, uh, let me just quickly show you one movie. I'm a little. So this is uh, just a movie to show you what that would look like. So this is a close-up of an antenna as it repositions. Watch here. There you see those bristles come out of the intercuticular fold. So we, we thought that this then constitutes a stimulus for the uh, mechanosensory stimulus for the brain to know that the antenna is out of that or has moved. So the first thing we needed to do was obviously ablate this and see what happens. So if we ablate this, then the animal should not be able to position its antenna. So we ablate the whole thing. This is a normal moth. You can see its antennae are positioned properly. And this is a moth in which the right antenna does not have any Bohm's bristles. And you can see that this moth is unable now to position its antenna. Uh, it just hangs limply by the side uh, and therefore collides with the, um, with the wing. If you make partial ablations, you get partial results. So this one can position its antenna but cannot maintain its position. So Anand quantified these results and what we, uh, what we I, I can just summarize these results in, in a few graphics. Uh, so when you, um, when you ablate all the bristles, the antenna fails to position. When you ablate just the scapal bristles, again the antenna fails to position. But if you ablate the pedicellar bristles, these are much fewer in number than the scapal bristles. Uh, the antenna positions normally, at least to the best of our knowledge, we, we haven't seen any differences. Importantly, when you restrict that ped, the flagellum pedicellar joint, where the Johnston's organs sit, uh, if you restrict it by gluing it together, uh, the antenna still positions normally. So what that means is that the Johnston's organs are not involved in, in antennal positioning, but the, uh, the scapal bristles are, and maybe the pedicellar bristles, but we, we don't see any uh, evidence of that. Okay, so if that is the case, then what is the circuit like? So we ablated the bristles. It's easy to do. You can just brush it with a pair of forceps and they come off. And then you can dab it with a fluorescent dye. And all of these are uh, the cell bodies. And these are axons going down into this, into the antennal nerve. And they go down into a region of the brain uh, which is called the antennal motor and mechanosensory center. So the green here are the sensory bristles, uh, so from multiple uh, cells, and they arborize in this brain. So we were keen to know where the motor neurons are, because at some point the antennal, uh, the sensory neurons need to be able to have a conversation with the motor neurons for the antennal position to occur. So we backfilled the antennal muscles, and uh, what we saw was somewhat surprising. This was, uh, these are the cell bodies. This is the dendritic part uh, of the motor neurons, and the, those are the axons. And if you look at this closely, you can see that the arbors quite heavily overlap, and here's a section through that. The green being the sensory uh, signals, uh, the sensory uh, neurons, and the red being the motor neurons, motor dendrites. So that made us think that maybe this, this could be, uh, they may be directly connected. Of course, with, with these kind of fluorescent dye filling, you can't establish that there are uh, synapses between the two. So what we decided to do then was, uh, was asked what is the latency of the response if you stimulate the bristles, with what latency uh, do the antennal muscles uh, uh, respond? So we built this rig. This is uh, now the uh, bristles. There is a 
a stepper motor that periodically tickles these bristles, and then we can uh, run it any which way we like. And this is um, uh, just recording from the muscles underlying this. So we do this in two situations. So we uh, stimulate the pedicellar bristles and record from the intrinsic muscles. Intrinsic muscles being the muscles that move the pedicel uh, relative to scape. Or we uh, tickle the scapal bristles and uh, uh, record from the extrinsic muscles which move the scape relative to the head capsule. And the way we do this is uh, by going in and giving a very quick impulse. So that's the impulse. Um, and then recording uh, the spikes from the muscles underlying. And these are rasters from about 60 trials. And what you can see here is that the, the response uh, of the muscles uh, is, is of a very short latency. So we quantified the latency using two criteria. Uh, the latency to the first significant shift in firing, I think it's about five standard deviations or something like that. Uh, is under 10 milliseconds. Under 10 milliseconds is fairly indicative that this must be a monosynaptic response because there is one synapse between um, the sensory and the motor neurons, and then there's another synapse between the motor uh, neurons and the muscles, so the neuromuscular junction. And this is uh, a latency from both of those. So it's unlikely that there's another neuron in between. So that's the hypothesis uh, that we came up with. Uh, we have sensory neurons that connect to, to the uh, intrinsic motor neurons, or pedicellar neurons connecting to intrinsic motor neurons, scapal neuron connecting to the uh, antennal, uh, to the extrinsic motor neurons. And there could be cross connections. We still need to explore that. But all this looked very nice. Uh, looks like a classic sensory motor reflex. Any deviation from the set point, the sensors pick it up. And then they directly stimulate the motor neurons, which then provides a corrective action to the antenna. Other than that, because we know that uh, when a moth initiates flight, you know, there are motor commands coming from elsewhere, we know that there must be motor commands coming from the higher centers. And we thought this is great. So far, so good. But then things got a little uh, more interesting. Uh, but before I go there, let me just quickly say that um, bones bristles are not just something you find in moths. They are, in fact, something you find in all insects. Uh, we've done a fairly broad survey of, uh, and we're continuing this survey. Uh, but here you see them uh, arranged around the base of a B antenna, right there. It's not arranged in fields, as you saw in the case of moths, but uh, it is arranged all around. And you see variation in the way it's arranged, but you uh, see them in, an, uh, in a large number of uh, insects. With the exception of bugs, we haven't so far seen them in bugs, and we've looked at plenty, uh, and flies in which the antenna is uh, completely reshaped. Uh, so, so even if they're there, we can't recognize them. But in all these other diverse taxa, and more than this, more since this uh, slide was made, uh, we see the presence of Bohm's bristles. And what that suggests is that this may be an ancestral feature of the Neopterans. And uh, that's not surprising, because positioning the antenna is a very critical aspect in uh, most insect slides. OK, so I said things got interesting. Why did they get interesting? They got interesting because a student came to me and he said, when I loom a brush about so, and this is when he was recording from the antennal muscles. He said, when I loom a brush above, um, above the uh, eyes of a moth, I see changes in the um, activity in the antennal muscles. And that was interesting and surprising because that meant that there was also visual inputs into the, into the same little circuit that we were so caught up in. So Anand uh, put together a quick and dirty rig where he was uh, recording from one side, muscles on one side, and then uh, hitting it with an L hitting uh, the eyes with, with an LED, uh, which turned on on or off, uh, and 
while he's recording from the same muscle, the LED might uh, uh, stimulate either this eye or this eye, and we put something in between so that the eyes, uh, so, so there's no crossover of the light. And when he did that, what he saw was that these muscles responded to stimulation of both eyes. So what I forgot to say earlier was that the entire mechanosensory response that you saw from the antenna, from the Bohm's bristles, was all on one side. It was entirely contained in the ipsilateral side. There was nothing going contralateral. None of the projections of the Bohm's bristles ever went contralateral. In fact, none of the Johnson Joggins projections that uh, we've seen so far have gone contralateral. So everything, all the mechanosensory information from the antenna is contained on just one side. But the light, uh, the visual response, on the other hand, uh, we're getting uh, on, on both sides, which suggests that uh, vision is used to somehow coordinate the motion of the two antennae. So we do uh, an impulse type experiment again. Here, give a quick stimulus. Here's the raster. And now the latencies of the visual response are in the, on the order of 50 milliseconds uh, or so, which is, again, not surprising, given that uh, visual transduction is a much slower process. And there are several layers of interneurons uh, before it can get to the uh, internal motor and mechanosensory center. Surprisingly, we don't see much of a difference between uh, the intrinsic muscle, uh, or it, it, between the, the um, ipsilateral uh, uh, stimulation and contralateral stimulation. So both respond at roughly the same time with the same latencies. So we've taken this one step further, going from uh, just simple LEDs to stripes. and. Uh, trying to understand if there's a directionality to this uh, response in the antennae. And uh, we do see uh, very strong indications of directionality. So there are four situations in which Anand runs this experiment. One is, one is in uh, fictive forward translation, meaning he sees the stripes, uh, with the moth sees the stripes go back. So what, what we have is a moth uh, with a screen, two, two screens in front of it. And the screens display stripes. In one case, the stripes go back, which should give the moth the, the illusion of it going forward. In other case, the, uh, the stripes go forward, which should give the moth the illusion of going backward. And then they go either clockwise or in anti-clockwise rotation. And what we see is that we get the strongest response when the moth is flying backwards. Uh, I can make stories that maybe the moth doesn't like flying backwards, so it, it responds best when uh, it's, it, it's going in a fictive backwards mode, but I'm, I'm not very sure why that is. OK, so what we have here is a circuit that is not just uh, you know, a, a monosynaptic circuit with respect to the mechanosensors, but also a multimodal circuit uh, which, is, uh, which is responding to visual inputs. And antennae, I mean, it shouldn't surprise us that antennae respond to visual inputs. Um, but this opens up possibilities that there may be other inputs, olfactory inputs, uh, a primary on my mind, that may also be involved in all of this. Because you can imagine a moth trying to position its antennae in a way that allows it to smell better. So that's something we need to uh, start looking at in due time. And I just wanted uh, to play this film. This is from a completely different project. This uh, is uh, a project that, um, where we're looking at how flies are using visual information to track odor sources. Um, I thought I'll put it here just as a way of uh, thinking about how important visual input is to fly. So here's a fly coming in. Uh, let me set this up before I play it. Uh, so what we have here is one bead. It's a bead, black bead. The fly can see it. It's, the whole thing is inside a wind tunnel. The arrow here is the direction of the wind. Uh, we we uh, release a fly upwind. And we give it several different stimuli. And I'm just showing two of them. One is a bead. Uh, with 
with, uh, with an odor inside it. And that creates a plume, a r roughly conical in shape. And you'll see how the fly responds when it hits the plume. Here are two beads, only one of which, I think the right one, uh, is the one which has uh, an, od uh, an odor source. And the challenge for the fly is to be able to then figure out that it is that one which has the odor source and not the other. And we give it a, a clutter of visual sources uh, and so on. So, so here's the fly. Makes up its mind and then lands. Okay, I'll show this movie again because I. Okay, so it strays a little bit, and then at some point it will get into the plume and then go forward. So it's far from the plume, decides to turn. Now hits the plume, knows it's there, and flies straight to it. Okay, and in this case, let's see what the presence of an additional visual source does. So away from the plume. Go straight. And you can see that this time it's not going directly, but it's actually uh, searching to between one or the other one until it finally makes up its mind about which one. So vision is a very important uh, thing for us insects to be paying attention to. Uh, in conjunction to smelling. And we have uh, a, a, a hypothesis that we're, we're trying to test, which is that flies, when they are tracking odors, actually uh, at some point uh, wait, uh, uh, hover over objects to see if what they're smelling is the same as what they're seeing. Are these the same flies? Sorry? Yeah. No, no, these are completely untrained. Uh, they are always new. Uh, but we do many of them. Huh? Yeah, it's tough to train flies. That's part of the problem. Uh, but we are also doing similar things with bees, but not, not exactly these experiments, but we are using bees. Uh, in, in certain other paradigms. But no, with flies, training them or something like this is very difficult. Okay, so let's see how much time I have. Do I have some time? Okay. Now let me go into another part of the project. Um, and this time, I didn't expect I would have time. Uh, I'm going to talk about hot ears. Uh, so I, I'm actually going to talk about the soldier fly part. Uh, and this is... Uh, now looking at hot ears, so we, you know, we, we, we went through this one exercise where we saw there was a nice reflex and so on. And there was another question we were thinking about. And this one is a soldier fly. Uh, and here are the hot ears. And watch how they flap, or the hot ears vibrate exactly antiphase uh, to the wings. This one flaps 100 times a second. But if you were to look at something like mosquitoes, they would still show you the same kind of uh, uh, tight phase relationship between uh, wings and uh, hot ears. Now the base of the hot ears are very complex mechanosensory structures. Each bump here is a companiform sensillum. There are fields of these companiform sensillae and there are many fields like these. All of them are um, strain sensors. So the, so the hot ear is vibrating and uh, as the animal turns, the hot ears experience Coriolis forces. Uh, and these strain sensors then uh, are supposed to encode it and tell the insect about whether it's turning or pitching or rolling or yawing. Now, we were in interested in knowing how is the hot ear being able to coordinate relative to the wing? How does the hot ear know where the wing is? And so we started filming this. Uh, this is where the animal actually takes off. So it starts from here, and what we noticed early on was that the, the wings and the hot ears were always out of phase. And so we thought maybe it's, uh, it's a reflex, like, like the example that I just showed you, or it could be a, a mechanically linked 
uh, system. So it turned out that the latter hypothesis is the one that uh, actually pans out. So here's a dead fly. And what uh, my graduate student Tanvi uh, will do is move this wing. It's a dead fly, so the nervous system isn't working. And as you can see, the halteas move exactly antiphase to the wings, but also that the, the other wing, which is, which is not being moved, uh, moves in phase with this wing. And that suggested that there are mechanical links between the wings and the halteas, and maybe uh, links going between halteas and wings on each side. So now the thorax is made up of scutum and scutellum. This is the reduced hind thorax in a dipteran, which has arms going down into the base of the wing. And we were interested in knowing what is the linkage between the wings and wings. What is it that links the two wings? And this is a summary diagram of uh, several experiments that Tanvi conducted uh, with the dead bug. So if you have an intact animal, you move one wing, the other wing moves, and the halteas move down. If you make a topical cut across the top of the, uh, uh, of the thorax, then that coordination goes away. You can cut the thorax. Uh, but if you just cut the, the scutum, then you don't lose that coordination, which means that the scutum isn't involved in, uh, in, in linking the two wings. Uh, also, from this experiment, we know that there's a separate linkage between the wing and the halteas, okay? because that coordination did not go away. Next, we just made a slit on top of the scutellum, and then the co coordination went away, which means that the scutellum is what links the two wings through those those arms that I showed you. And this is true not just for live animals. This one is a normal animal uh, on a stick. And you can see the wings moving in nice synchrony and the uh, halteas out of phase. But this is also true. So when you make a cut the scutellum, then you see that the coordination completely goes away. So now we. But one of the things to notice here is that even though we've cut the scutellum, the halteas are still exactly antiphase to the wings, which means that there is a separate linkage, and we need to find out what it was. So uh, it took Tanvi a fair bit of time to figure out that there was a thickened piece of cuticle internally to the thorax uh, that connected the base of the wing to the base of the haltea. And then when she made cuts, in, the, uh, in this uh, particular, what we call the ephemeral ridge, then uh, uh, that coordination went away, as you can see here on the left side. So just the left side coordination uh, linkage is cut. And you can see that the two halteas are not synchronous at all. In fact, this halteer uh, is not. So we have now a model. Uh, that, that we are working with, where the indirect flight muscle moves the scutellum. So it's actuating the scutellum. And then the scutellum actuates both wings. But the scutellum also is connected to the halteas, to the wing haltier link. Now, the halteas are moving independently because they have their own sets of muscles. And their frequency is the same as the frequency of the wing. So what the wing halteal linkage does really is, uh, is uh, uh, coordinate the phase. So now one of the things we had, so this is, this is a bit of a problem for insects, because if all of its thorax is linked, then it loses its ability to independently control any of this. Anytime it moves one wing, the other must move, and the halteas must move, and that's a problem. But we know that insects can move one wing, flap one wing on one side. For instance, when Drosophila uh, courts uh, a female, uh, a male courts a female, it only flaps one wing. So we argued that there must be uh, some sort of an, uh, an engagement, disengagement mechanism. And this was also something that Tanvi had noticed when she uh, was, was working with the dead bugs, that she could pop in or pop out the wing. And, and then the coordination worked or it did not work. 
And so what we did was uh, looked at these two situations, the wing popped in and the wing popped out, and, uh, uh, and the scanning electron microscope uh, scopy of this. And so this is a part of the thorax called the pleural wing process. It's this geared structure. And this is uh, part of the wing, and this structure is called the radial stop. Now, when the wing is engaged, the radial stop uh, sits on top of the pleural wing process. And when it's disengaged, uh, it sits on, uh, it's, it's disconnected from it. And this is something we now have a video of, uh, but, but uh, the video isn't clear enough uh, to show on uh, like this thing. But I can, I can show it to you uh, later if you'd like. So in this case, we didn't see any uh, a neural involvement. We, uh, we realized that the Hortia wing coordination was uh, through mechanical linkages. And that helps us explain movies like this. Uh, let me just quickly play this movie. So if you watch the wings of that animal carefully, it's going to land. But they're moving in perfect coordination up until about here, and you'll suddenly see the wing actually disengage, or what we think is getting disengaged there. And when that happens, you can see the two plots separate out. Uh, otherwise, you can't tell them apart because they are, these are just the wing angles. OK, so do, am I run out of time? OK. So I'll stop there. I'll just quickly show you one more movie, because this is where we are going now. With, uh, so we are now filming behave, more complex behaviors. Here's a fly chasing another fly. It's a territorial behavior. And we want to be able to see how such complex behaviors are constructed from simpler behaviors, such as pitching, rolling, yawing. How does this fly manage uh, You know, when, when the haltiers are manipulated or when, when you change inputs, for instance. There's a slam. But if the same fly finds a female, this was a male-male interaction, it's more gentle. So here's a female. She's not flying at all. The, the male is doing all the work. It's going to gently drop her on the surface and fly away. So it's complex behaviors like this that we would really like to get at. And now we are being able to film them in a little box. Uh, it took us a while to get the conditions right. OK, so thank you. Is there learning in that? Does it try to predict some kind of statistics of the flower movement? I'm almost certain it does. So how does it respond in the early on, like in the very transient when you start to change the, the, the movement of the... So we haven't looked at that carefully yet, but this is something we need to be able to do. Um, so the idea being, so learning is something I've just not gotten into because it's, it's completely, we are so focused right now on the mechanics and just the first order stuff that we haven't gone there. But it's, it's something that's crossed my mind uh, about whether if we now get it to uh, so if we start the flower from scratch and then suddenly start moving it faster and faster, at what point, and, and then suddenly change, does it make mistakes in the first few cycles before it gets it right? Because that would suggest that it's, it's predicting. And can you say something like how fast movements it can track? <laughs> uh, so one of the ways in which one can quantify this, how I won't say how fast movements, but this, there's a quantity called flicker fusion rate, which means if you take an LED and you start blinking it at different frequencies, then uh, at what point do you, and you can measure uh, the ERGs, the uh, electroretinograms from the moth's eye, and you can see these changes, these fluctuations that are exactly the same as the frequency of the LED. Uh, in, in the receptor potential. And at some point, they go away. So that's uh, like flicker fusion rate. And in the case of 
moth and, and that is very interesting this is something we are doing a large survey of in diurnal versus nocturnal moths, uh, butterflies um, and other insects. And what we find is that diurnal insects typically are in the range of let us say 150 to 250 hertz which means they are processing it much faster humans are about 25 right. Uh, whereas moths are in the region of something like 80 to 120 hertz. So that is how fast they see flickering light uh, or before they you know they, but it is there is a difference between nocturnal and, and diurnal insects. And so what we would like to do actually is look at animals that are typically that are secondarily nocturnal like butter, some butterflies. Butterflies are typically diurnal but some butterflies have adopted a nocturnal lifestyle. Um, to stay away from predators and so on. And so in these ones, uh, you know, we would like to see what, what the flicker fusion rates are. Sandhya? In the wing motion. Yeah, so that is a difficult experiment for the following reasons. We have tried this in bees and moths and neither of them fly. <laughs> in, if they, they cannot position their antennae they just do not take off. And so you know so then we do not know you know if you tether them and you look at their wings the wing motion looks okay. But they do not fly uh, they are just reluctant. And these are human and we are not developing them. No they are just in the adult no, no development. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we think that the uh, the uh, the um, Bohm's bristles are connected to motor neurons with cholinergic. Uh, they're cholinergic neurons. I think there's acetylcholine it's involved in that. But that's something we are looking up. Now. Okay. Thanks, Pranay. The session, a few important announcements. So, first of all, there's tea outside. So, that will run concurrently with the poster session. So, uh, tea and snacks are like from now until about 6. And poster session will run until uh, 7 o'clock. And uh, for those who are staying in uh, IIT guest house, uh, the IMSC guest house, and Asian Hotel, we have arranged dinner in the same place that you had lunch. So that's from 7 to 8.30. So between 8 and 8.30, we have arranged cars to take you back to your respective hotels and uh, guest houses. So uh, you know, uh, from 8 onwards, we'll start gradually uh, you know, uh, putting you in various cars. and.